Welcome to Retire Smart with David Brooks. I'm Chip Maxwell. Well, David, just uh, I, I want to quickly apologize in advance to listeners if my voice sounds a little scratchy, a little raw yet. Uh, I'm still hoarse from trying to scream my beloved corn huskers to victory, alas, to no avail. David, it's only a game, though. It's only a game. It's only a game. You know, I've repeated that to myself about a thousand times, and it's not working. It's not helping, David. <laughs> uh, well, listen, let's face it. If you uh, uh, you know, took the time to travel across <laughs> the Atlantic Ocean to go to this game. A thousand mile you, round you, trip. You're really invested, and, in, in, uh, you know, you have a right to be disappointed. Let's face it. Um, that was not <laughs> the showing we would have wanted to see. Um, I, I do want to thank my two sons for the public record, Tomas and Oto. They're, they're in their early 30s now. Uh, but their birthday gift to me this year was to take their Irish Husker fan father to this game. Uh, so I very much appreciated that. But oh, my goodness. Mm. All right. But it's only a game. It's well, hopefully game. you enjoyed Dublin and the surrounding it areas. It was. Uh, bit, the people so. were great. The weather was great. Everything was great except the performance of the team. But <laughs> <laughs> well, we have we have 11 more games, right? 11 and 1. 11 and 1. 11 and 1. Okay. Um, uh, on a more serious note, David, uh, we we also saw <laughs> some, uh, th there were there was rough sailing. There were turbulent seas, stormy seas in the markets this week. Yeah, yeah, you could say that for sure. Um, we talked about the you know the markets had a bit of a sugar high. They they came off the June lows and rallied pretty far, uh, pretty fast. But a lot of that was due to some technical things called short coverings and some other areas. But the fundamentals continued to not lay out a very rosy picture of our economy and the current administration keeps rolling out uh, ideas and, and actual, uh, you know, executive orders and, and things they're trying to do that are going to send us the wrong direction, economically speaking, and uh, not, not a lot of good news out there. But again, the biggest message we always told people is don't panic. You know, there are ways through this. The country's gone through a lot worse in the past, and we get through it. You just need to have a guide, if you will, to, to kind of help you understand it. But, the, you know, uh, there's so much economic data out there. What I want to talk about for a moment, Chip, is the housing market in general. We talked about how strong it had been, and it's turned, and it is turning fast and in a, in a negative way, a well, lot faster than most people, most analysts had predicted. Last week, we had a story about, well, the housing market is facing headwinds. This week, David, CNBC, home prices fell for the first time in three years last month, and it was the biggest decline since 2011. Now we're talking about the biggest drop in more than a decade. It's getting serious. No, absolutely. And, and, and we still have a supply shortage. So here's the thing. There will be some uh, where area it stops, but these places that went parabolic in prices, and we're talking in particular uh, some towns in California on the coast, south, southern Florida, Phoenix, Scottsdale, Arizona, where these prices just went almost parabolic up 20% a year, year over year, two or three years in a row, that's just unsustainable growth as anything, you, you know, everything returns to the mean, right? And that's why we use math. And so housing prices got ahead of themselves, and boy, now it's more than just softening now, you're seeing price declines already, and most people expect softening of prices but not necessarily declines and yet we're actually just saw year over year price declines where we were still just six to ten weeks ago chip people were listing a home and selling it in three to four hours and that has already gone to now you're listing sitting out there for three or four weeks uh, and the inventory has ballooned to almost 11 months nationwide of inventory a normal market folks has about six months inventory right we were running under three months inventory for a long time last several years so that's why when someone listed it it got sold rather quickly there's just so few choices and if you had to purchase well you had to pull the trigger and make an offer and so and i and i do and fully disclose i do invest quite a bit in real estate i have several rental properties in multiple states and i've I've had, I had to make an offer on one, I, and I did. I successfully closed and purchased a rental this year. But it was basically sight unseen, just on pictures, et cetera. Now, I can afford to do that, and, and I know the market, et cetera. But for people that are trying to find shelter to buy their, their home they're going to live in, that's a very difficult market for them to, to navigate. And now, just what if you just felt like you overstretched because you paid more than you wanted to, Chip? Imagine you're that that young couple and you did your first real purchase of a major mortgage and the price is already going negative six months after you bought the house and your your interest rates are higher than you thought and you're 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 kind of locked into this mortgage and that can be uh, depressing let's face it so anyway the housing market's going to go through more pain the reason i want to talk about the housing market in general is 
We've never had economic bottoms, the depressions and recessions, et cetera. We never clear those recessions again on the other side until the housing market turns for the better. And housing is just now cracking, which means we're probably in for a litany of pain here over the next year in the broader economic situation of our country. David, uh, another little present, little gift inside that Inflation Reduction Act, student loan forgiveness is is coming under the full glare of the public spotlight now. We're finding out exactly what this involves. Fox Business headline, student loan deal could cost $900 billion and favor top earners. That's so <laughs> much for the $280 billion uh, in, in alleged savings in the, in, oh in the previous goodness. act, the Inflation Reduction Act, and now he's spending $900 billion. And by uh, the way, th this analysis is from the Penn Wharton budget model. Again, this is the University of Pennsylvania, Ivy League, the Wharton School of Business. Would you remind us of your connection to the Wharton School and, and then explain this seemingly contradictory result? Well, we follow a lot of Wharton's research. I've been blessed to do a perceptorship there. I've actually studied uh, under Jeremy Siegel one of the lead professors there. He's a, one of the talking heads you'll see on you know, CNBC and things like that a lot. Um, but, you know, th these guys don't hold any punches back, and they are most certainly a left-leaning college as an Ivy League school, just so you know. When they run these analyses, they're just giving you the numbers. Math is math. Uh, this and is not the Heritage Foundation. This is not some conservative think tank. No, not, not at all. Numbers. And, and so they're telling you that basically this is going to skew towards exactly higher income earners, right? So mainly white-collar people are going to benefit from this. And look, it's, this is ridiculous. I, the analogy I put out there is it's very simple. Why should we reduce $10,000 of debt of an attorney, right, uh, and then put that on the back of a waitress. Yeah, Explain right. the logic there, because that's what we're doing. There's no, there's no debt forgiveness. It's a transfer of who owes the debt. We're taking it from one person who agreed to the debt, signed on for the debt, and transferring that to all of us as taxpayers. I paid my way through school, okay? I never took one penny of student loan debt. I actually, it, it took me a long time to finish. I worked my way through, right? And I, which I think most people should. You'll appreciate it more. My wife did take student loan debts out, and when I married her, I had to pay those off. So I was already transferred some debt once in my life, and I paid it off from somebody else's uh, schooling. Uh, but here's the thing. This is going to cost $900 billion, just the forgiveness part, Chip. But here's the part the article doesn't cover, and this is a glaring problem. It also, in his executive order, if it comes to fruition, and again, there's some constitutionality, this will be challenged, but if it passes, they will cap what you repay, Chip, to 5% of your income. So there's no limit to how much you can borrow, and they're going to cap what you have to repay, and then after 20 years of paying that 5% of your income, the rest is forgiven. So if you borrow a half a million dollars for tuition to go to some crazy uh, overpriced school, and you end up with a job making $50,000 a year, the most you're going to have to pay back is about $210 a month, and after 20 years, they just forgive the balance. So we're totally divorced. We're totally separated reality from, is from gone. economic reality, from economic principles. We're just playing political games with money to make people feel good. College instead. inflation has run over 8.5% for two decades now. Now. It will double. It will double if this comes to fruition. This is insanity to the highest degree. And you need to get on the phone and call your legislators and tell them. Because some of these people that are out there on social media, some of the folks that are promoting this is a great thing, haven't read the bill or read the, uh, the executive order in its full summary. And we've done the analysis. Just that provision of 5% cap is insanity. It's going to give carte blanche for tuition raises all over the country. Just like the uh, Inflation Reduction Act's putting this credit on electric vehicles, and all the electric vehicle companies immediately rose their prices eight to $10,000. Folks, it's just another government handout. And again, the government has no money. They are taking it from you and I as taxpayers. You should be livid about this stuff. Well, as you said, it will be challenged. We'll keep an eye on it for you and report back on, on whatever developments occur. David, uh, in the moment or so we have left in this segment, I want to go global with you. Uh, this is from townhall.com. Biden's quote-unquote unprecedented sanctions against Russian oil completely backfired. Oh, the Biden administration, we're going to bring Russia to its knees. Russia's making money hand over fist on oil. What's going on here? Well, if we're not producing oil, guess where Europe's going to have to get their oil from? Russia, right? They're the closest large producer, and they are taking it hand over fist because they need energy. And Russia's in complete control now, and they're they're making billions of dollars raking in. This is the only thing keeping their economy afloat, and, and our current country's stance towards them is absolutely ridiculous. And 
OPEC is talking about cutting production, right, and which is going to drive prices up again. So be prepared for your bills, your energy bills. There's a energy crisis in Europe right now. It's $1,000 a kilowatt is expected to be what they're going to pay uh, from like $80 in the next 12 months. And so this will create some massive problems there. And it's, but we're going to have recessionary problems here. The price of your electric bill. So your utility companies, OPPD, MUD, if, wherever you're getting utilities, pay attention to your prices over the next six months and start to see what's creeping in there. And this is going to cause real economic pain for, unfortunately, more and more pain is going to be attributed to the lower income quadrants in our society. The bottom 40% are really going to be struggling because those are the folks that are literally living week to week, paycheck to paycheck. While all of that is true, don't let it freeze you. Don't let it numb you. Don't panic. Don't be complacent. We have dozens of strategies to deal with some of the scenarios that David just described. Give us a call, 402-369-7777 for a complimentary report card. No charge, no obligation, 402-369-7777. Up next, David Brooks is great, but it takes a team to do what we do at Retire Smart. A vital part of that team is financial. Welcome back to Retire Smart with David Brooks. I'm Chip Maxwell. We have a guest this week who brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to every client and every case in our smart plan process. In fact, she helped build the smart plan process. David, please introduce our special guest. Yeah, thank you, Chip. Yeah, absolutely excited. We've got Dane Lawyer, one of our financial advisors, uh, it back in the studio. Dane, thanks for joining us again on the uh, on the show. Happy to be back. So, uh, listen, I, I want to stay on topic we've been talking about here on the show for weeks, and that's the number one concern of retirees surveyed here in the last 90 days, and that is inflation, right? Uh, inflation has become such a, a uh, issue, and it's starting to affect people in ways a lot of people weren't expecting. Uh, and unfortunately, as we've talked about on the show many times already, it affects, unfortunately, the lower the income, the more it hurts you because it's making people actually spend more than 100% of their take-home pay mm -hmm. to pay for goods and services. But but I wanted, what I want to spend some time with you is the unique... Uh, angle, if you will, of, you know, we were talking about, you, you know, just being a young professional uh, female, when you have your own challenges in, in that regard, you, you work in a very highly competitive field, right? And, yeah. and you flourish and we're so happy you're here. <laughs> um, but let's face it, right? It's it, it, our industry has been male dominated, number one, for for decades, and, and they're trying to do a better job now of recruiting. We've certainly done that here uh, to diversify, et cetera. But, but women in general in the career field, right, in whatever career they are, obviously they are still typically the primary person in, in the home life when you have dual-income families that are going to take care of the child's arrangements, uh, do the grocery shopping, you know, <laughs> you know, after-school activities, all that stuff. Some reason still seems to be pushed more on to – uh, the the female uh, you know in in the couple relationship so when it comes to inflation there was a unique article I sent to you that I thought was pretty interesting the headline talks about how inflation acutely more affects women in particular in particular those that are working can you talk a little about the article and, and you know why that is yeah absolutely this article really actually hit home like you had said you know I do have my two young children at home and I'm a full-time working mom but like you said it does hit women um, you know, a little harder at this time. There is that gender imbalance of those household duties. In fact, three-fourths of women take on the duties as far as grocery shopping, child care, things like that. So there's a doctor that's quoted in this Market Watch article, actually, that she's had patients who are feeling angry, depressed, anxious, mostly fearful about their finances in this time just because they are the primary caregiver and household shopper, things like that. So they're seeing these things hit them harder at this time as far as inflation goes. Um, the CPI rose 9.1 in June, and food prices have shot up 12.2% in the past year. So since women are typically doing more of the shopping, they're seeing that bill increase. Now, I just want to point out here, that is accurate, and, and there's a lot of research here. Pew Research did this. It's about 75% of 
of, of couples, right, that are husband and wife, where the female, 75%, three out of four, are the ones that go into the shop. Yes. I just want to point out and clarify that is not how it works in my household. <laughs> my wife doesn't know what aisle anything's on in the grocery store. She does occasionally get into a grocery store, but <laughs> and I'm also the one that cooks. Well, has cooked. She's learned uh, in the last couple of years, so if she's listening this week, <laughs> <laughs> she can cook. Uh, my wife is a terrific cook. She just chooses not to. And, and just if you guys have listened, I used to in restaurant. I love cooking, so I love doing the entertaining and cooking. So I do most of the grocery shopping in my household because I'm pretty particular about what I buy. <laughs> I will say that my husband does a really, really great job of stepping up and sharing those duties with me. In fact, he has he's done it a lot more recently just because. He has the ability to work remote sometimes, so he has actually been able to take on some more of those duties as far as helping get the kids to daycare. And my daughter Genevieve just actually started junior kindergarten, so now we're going to two separate places. So he's really stepped up and helped out in that way. So that's a real challenge for a young mm -hmm. professional. I remember, you know, my boys are all obviously grown now, uh, adults, but when those kids go to multiple schools, in fact, one of our employees, uh, you know, two of our employees actually have seven kids. <laughs> so one of our employees, uh, Larry, uh, he, he had four kids at four different schools just two years ago. And I mean, the morning routine alone and trying to juggle that, you know, is, is amazing. So I just commend people. That, but the reality is most couples are going to be what we call dual income couples. Both are going to be required to work to survive in today's economic environment. And I think you and Jason do a, a, a great job. But let's let's stay on that for a moment. Let's just talk about career paths, if we will. Mm -hmm. So inflation is really obviously a, a burdensome problem. And so some people, uh, if they're not feeling uh, encouraged or happy in their current job of any form, right, we always tell people you, you should find something you're passionate about. And, you know, there's the old saying, you know, find a job you love doing what you do and you'll never work a day in your life. And, of course, right. that's not really true, but, but it certainly makes it easier to get up and go to work if you enjoy the work that you do. So talk a little bit about why you, again, chose this career path and just what advice you would give to professional women out there in general if they're not happy in their current situation and what, how to find maybe an employer that also has the culture and values to allow for flexibility, especially for single moms or, or, or dual income families that you just got to rearrange. I mean, like we, we, we're pretty flexible. You do have two young ones. We have several employees that have young kids. And I'm the first one to tell you, don't miss the soccer game or don't miss your kid getting the award, even if it's kindergarten finger painting. Be there for those moments because you don't get them back. Right. Yeah. And I'll kind of start off that obviously when COVID hit, a lot of women, um, you know, and families in general had that ability to work remote. So a lot of people were at home. But now that things are starting to shift and we see women and men both going back to work, obviously that calls for a different type of challenge. So like you said, David, really finding an employer and a boss that you can work for that is flexible and, you know, takes all those things into consideration because you only get those moments once. Right. So you know, finding one, a career you're happy in. And, you know, I have fell in love with this career year after year. And I owe a lot of that to David here just because he is a great boss. He is always encouraging us to go do those things we want to do and spend our time with our family. Um, you know, whether it be, hey, Wednesday mornings, I'm going to be here a half hour late. You know, we work it out and we find time. So really try and find an employer or someone you work for that's going to make those small changes with you and work with you and, you know, help you out in the ways you need to be helped in these in these rough times yeah and and it's challenging because a lot of companies as you said during the pandemic a couple years ago just about 90 percent of employers went remote right and that is shifting back in a big way because they're finding unfortunately and that's just reality and we talked about on the show in the in past months productivity is dropping for for people that work remotely. Uh, you miss the what we call the water cooler innovation. You don't walk down the hall. Hey, I got an idea, Dane. Let's do you know, but because it's not a scheduled Zoom meeting, you're going to miss those innovative talks, etc. So I think it's so important people find balance in their life, working and in retirement. And speaking of finding that balance in retirement. Not only do we want to help people, and, and you do such a great job of sitting down and giving people the potential to know they're on the right path, right? They've got an actual plan that addresses all the key areas of retirement. Our smart proprietary process helps you do that. But just engaging with the client so that they understand, look, the money's it's just a tool, right? right so that you can resource, live your life, yeah. right? Because like you're with the young kids now, but how many of our clients want to spend time with the young grandkids, you know, and, and, and take them on trips, take them to Disney World, take cruises, or just dote with them and spend time at the wood shop or after school with the kids. I mean, I can tell how many of our clients just love 
babysitting the grandkids one or yes. two days a week after school, <laughs> those type of things. So, so I think that is so important in the overall holistic planning process that people understand why they have to have a plan, a financial plan that gives them flexibility and freedom to, to do what they want in their life, whatever stage they're in. And, and obviously we are retirement centric focused here at Retire Smart, but I just love that, you know, I, and it's kind of cool. And thanks for the kudos shout out early here, <laughs> but I love giving you guys, the team members, all of them, the flexibility for where they are in life. Like, like actually Nick, who's producing this show right now, sitting off camera here, uh, Nick's about to become a father for the first time here. That's, yes. that's coming up pretty quick, Nick. So we're looking at you, <laughs> but yeah, you were going through some life changes and we, we try to provide flexibility and he actually had a little life event hiccup, but gave him a PTO day yesterday. Take care of it, you know. So stuff happens, and we want to be flexible for people. But people's financial plans need to be flexible, especially when times get a little ugly. We're going to go through a, a what looks like it could be a pretty rough recession over the next year, year and a half, um, and inflation is not going away. So coming back on that topic of inflation – you know, talk a little bit about how we're able to help clients fight inflation, you know, by helping them lower certain expenses throughout the retirement planning process, like taxes or what have you, you know. Right. Yeah. So tax planning is obviously our specialty and passion. That's what we preach. It's what we talk about all the time. So finding a strategy over 60 that we have in our back pocket that's going to work specifically for you to really go in and fight that, it's going to counterbalance the inflation. Um, so, you know, coming in, having a visit, seeing what we can do for you. We have, again, a lot of tricks up our sleeve, a lot of things we can utilize for our clients. Again, every every person has a different life experience, a different financial position they're in. So, you know, there's no cookie cutter plan that we can put in place for anyone specifically. We really have to dig in and see what we can do to help you. And we always say it's not a matter of if we can save you money on taxes. It's just a matter of how much. Absolutely. And, and uh, you know, the earlier you start the planning process, the better. So if you would like to, uh, to you know, come in and, and sit down and have a consultation, if you're out there and if you're the single, uh, you're the sole breadwinner or you're a single mom or you're a dual income family and you're a female in particular, but you just haven't gotten into the financial stuff, if you'd like to have a consultation with Dane, uh, a lot of clients request they would like to have a female financial advisor. Uh, happy to provide that uh, with you. You can just give us a call here at 402-369-7777. So uh, listen, thanks for stopping by the, the studio this week, Dane. And uh, you know, uh, Dane is here to help you with all your financial planning needs, uh, in particular helping you understand how to fight inflation if you're the one out there seeing it on the grocery bill. I know the uh, Brooks Bacon Barometer is up over 40% year over year. <laughs> That's one of my, my uh, thresholds. The good news is red meat has been coming down a little bit here uh, recently, but there are lots of uh, headwinds coming for uh, grocery shopping. So if you're smart, you would stock up on some of those items. So, uh, Chip, what do we have next? Up next, you have questions. David Brooks has answers. We reach into the mailbag next on Retire Smart with David Brooks. Welcome back to Retire Smart with David Brooks. I'm Chip Maxwell. Into the mailbag we go. Charlotte says, this feels like a confession. I am 63, single, and have about $700,000 combined in an IRA and a 401k. I want to retire in two years, but my confession is that I have done nothing about retirement. Am I too late? Did she miss the boat? Did she miss the train, David? All right. So, Charlotte, uh, you know, uh, we appreciate you making the confession, but you're not alone. And no, you're not too late. Uh, obviously, the better and earlier we start or, or the earlier we start, the better uh, the planning we can do, because there's certain things and timelines we'd, we wouldn't want to miss. At 63, there's actually a, a, a very important timeline you're hitting right now. And that is this ink, the income that you earn this year, Charlotte, at 63 will actually be what sets your Medicare premiums in two years when you want to retire at 65. And a lot of people don't know this. It's a two-year delay, Chips. In other words, your income, and most people don't realize this, it's called IRMA, and it's income-related monthly income, basically. How much income you receive each month in retirement, if you go over a certain threshold, you actually have to pay a penalty every month to access Medicare Part B on top of the premium that you're required to pay today, $170.10. If you go over that first penalty, it's a $68 monthly penalty, and then there's a $12 penalty on your Part D, which is your prescription drug coverage in Medicare. So, Charlotte, you're not too late, but 
just from what I just talked about, there are so many things people don't know. We always talk about on the radio. You don't know what you don't know. That you have to get planning so that you're at least aware of what's coming down the pipe. Now, you've done a good job, as many people have, Charlotte. You've kind of started just shoving money in an account and set it and forget it. And that's the blessing of the 401k and the 403b for most people is they started putting money in there, but they don't pay attention, right? They don't even know what's invested in. And we see this all the time. People go, I don't know. Oh, how'd you pick these funds? I don't. I don't remember picking them. <laughs> you know, they just kind of started setting some allocation once upon a time and just let it ride. And, you know, certainly there probably could have been better allocations potentially in there. We don't know, but it's not too late to plan. I don't care if you're 83 and you've already been retired for 10 years. It's never too late, uh, new, too late to have a proactive plan about the rest of your life. And so, Charlotte, you would be a fantastic candidate to get the report card so you can get an overview of where you stand on income taxes, health care expenditures, risk management, asset allocation, legacy planning, all those things could be combined. And we do the report card. We give you the 30,000 foot view, letting you know where you stand. So take advantage of that, Charlotte. Take, you know, don't hesitate much longer. David, if she's got that 700 grand sitting in a traditional IRA and a traditional 401k, might she be a candidate for a Roth conversion? Absolutely. Now, we don't know her income limits, et cetera, and all this and the information provided, but that's where we, when we do the overview, we could start to dive in and see what tax strategies would most certainly apply. And uh, I'm thinking three or four of them coming off my head right now that I would know would apply. But again, until we have all the information, we don't guess, right? We That's why we, when we ask people to come in, we ask for certain documentation because it's how we can devise an accurate plan to give you the best outcomes we believe based on what you're telling us, time horizons, resources, risk level, all those things factor into it. You're not too late, Charlotte, but don't delay. Take action now. Hey, Caleb says, I hear a lot of financial advisors talk about maximizing Social Security benefits, but I notice you use the word optimize. What's the difference? Caleb, you're, uh, you're making me smile here, my friend, because you're paying attention. This is really cool. Um, so let's just talk about in general. So when you go to draw your benefit, and it's not just Social Security, Caleb. So if you're blessed to work for an organization that gives you a pension, before you turn the pension on, there's some decisions that have to be made as well. And we want to help you optimize that decision as well. In other words, what I'm talking about there is you could have a single life annuity. Typically, they're going to pay you X amount a month when you retire on the pension for as long as you live. Or you could take a reduced amount and your survivor or your bene- you know, your spouse, et cetera, could also get payments if you were to die early. And this could be for period certain. It could be for lifetime. Uh, and there's different actuarial levels. You could have 75% of the benefit, 50 et cetera. So we want to help people optimize these decisions. So what's the difference, Caleb, to get to your point? If you can tell us the day you're no longer going to be here, we'll show you how to get the exact maximum benefit, the maximizing your Social Security, before you leave this earth. So if I know your end date. Now, here's the thing, Caleb. Insurance companies know this information within three months based on your gender, where you live, uh, how old you are, your lifestyle, et cetera, actuaries can predict incredibly accurate when, unfortunately, you would most likely leave this earth. Now, that's an aggregate. That's a little bit spooky. You're saying they can pinpoint it within three months? Well, yeah, and now this is aggregate. They're not going to tell Caleb, here's the three months, but they're going to tell all the people that are in Caleb that fit his demographic. demographic. Exactly, and that's how life insurance is priced. It's just, you know, it's actuarial science. You have to have some frame of reference. Yeah, Yeah. but the same frame of reference can be used. We can tell you what, what we believe your life expectancy to be. Now, there's some outside factors. Longevity in the family could increase that etc. It's a small percentage. But that's how you maximize Social Security, Caleb, is we, we basically have to make a best efforts guess on when you're no longer going to be here. And we can tell you when to draw Social Security to maximize that benefit. To optimize your Social Security, we have to add in the taxation of said benefit. And this is what most people just never give thought. Most advisors, unfortunately, never give a thought of. Social Security, folks, was never meant to be taxable income. But, of course, it is, okay, for most people. And up to 85% of your Social Security can be pulled into the income tax bucket, creating additional taxes on maybe interest you earned at a bank, on a CD, things like that. Again, people don't know what they don't know. So we want to show you how to optimize the benefit when we we calculate taxation into the benefits. And it might mean less raw dollars from Social Security, but more net dollars in your pocket. And the tax equation, Caleb, for a married couple can be a $50,000 plus plus mistake potentially if they turn it on at the wrong time with other sources of income, et cetera. This is why you have to have a proactive plan 
no matter who you're going to work with. Find someone that is going to be a fiduciary. That means they're going to put your best interest first versus a suitability recommendation, and they're going to devise an actual inflation-adjusted income plan and tell you when to turn on these types of sources of income. Those are, and Caleb, what you're talking about is what we call guaranteed income. There's two sources of income. You get retirement guaranteed, non-guaranteed. That's really it. And then we got to figure out how those things will be taxed. But there's a big difference. Thanks for the question. You have touched on one of the most important things I have learned, David, in my time at Retire Smart, and that is just building the biggest pile of money as quick as you can that isn't always the best strategy because you're forgetting about the taxation part of the equation. Well, it, it, like you said, right? It's not what you what you make; it's what you keep. Yep. You know, and mm-hmm. and uh, how much of that is really yours, and how much of that will really pass to your beneficiaries if you don't get to spend it in your lifetime? These are some very important questions. But without the proper planning and adding in the tax calculations, we see so many financial plans that yeah, you're fine, but boy, you're blowing up your estate, and you're also paying way more in taxes than you need to and some people care and some don't that's the reality but taxes folks is the number one expense you're going to face in retirement if you're not proactive in planning through it we can mitigate that and reduce it significantly which in this high inflationary environment is the the easiest way to help you fight back against this crazy high inflation hang on to every single dollar you can jude says my wife and i are in our early 70s and retired and i thought everything was settled Then in a recent radio show, you got my attention. Here's another one paying attention here, David. Uh, You got my attention by saying that I should not own my own life insurance policy. Did I misunderstand you? It sounded contradictory. Why wouldn't I own the policy insuring my life? David, this comes up periodically, but it's worth going over again. Okay, so Jude, great question. And and well over 90% of all insurance policies are, in fact, owned by the insured. Right. And this is when we meet most people. They take out insurance. Right. You buy life insurance on yourself and you buy life insurance for two reasons, folks. One, because you love somebody more than you love yourself. Right. You know, you want to take care of somebody when you're no longer here or you maybe don't love the organization known as the IRS because life insurance can help you uh, or help your loved ones at least pay taxes that may be due on your estate, things like that. Right. Or to replace income, et cetera, while you're alive. But yes, if you own your life insurance, Jude, here's the point. It is now considered part of your estate, and depending on what state someone lives in, states have an inheritance taxes and they have estate taxes. And if it's if you own it, those proceeds, even though the proceeds pay out tax free to the beneficiary, that number is calculated as part of your estate for the estate and or inheritance tax. Right? We're one of a handful of states that still has an inheritance tax here in Nebraska. Uh, There's several states that have an estate tax, and Maryland, which is where I was born, if you didn't know, I was born in Baltimore, Maryland. Maryland is the only state that has both an inheritance tax and an estate tax. Now, this is we're just talking state level. Now, you have to understand the federal. Uh, we don't have inheritance tax federally, but we do have a federal estate tax. And most people don't worry about it because the exemption today is over $12 million a person. That is going to change in a very big way, Chip, in just three years and about four months. That number drops to $5 million plus an inflation adjustment, probably about $5.7, $5.8 million. And a lot of folks that are retired today, a married couple that has a $2 million net worth in their 60s today, most likely has an estate tax problem. And by using life insurance or getting it into what's called an irrevocable life insurance trust, the preferred method to own it, that is now those death benefits are outside of your estate, so they're not pervy to those other taxes. And the benefits actually go to the beneficiary, and it helps reduce tax on your said estate. There's a lot more to it, Jude, but I'm out of time here on the answer. Hopefully you understand what I'm talking about here. But again, why you should come in and get the report card or even just schedule a 15-minute phone call with one of our advisors on the team so we can answer these questions specific to your unique situation. Well, let's talk about that, David, because we are out of time this week for Q&A. But if people want to schedule a 15-minute call with one of our advisors, how many openings do we have this Just week? Just four this week. You guys Ooh, are it's all, a tight week. Yeah, everybody's a little busy here. We are getting into the fall, and we have to get very proactive uh, with our current client base. But uh, we have four of those openings. If you'd like a 15-minute call, uh, call now. 402-369-7777. No charge, no obligation. 15 minute phone call with one of our advisors 402-369-7777 up next a few states are banning sales of new gas powered cars the bans would take effect in about a decade is this a hysterical blip or is it the future we'll explore that next on retire smart with david brooks
Welcome back to Retire Smart with David Brooks. I'm Chip Maxwell. David, the headline from townhall.com reads, Two more states follow California's lead in banning sales of new gas-powered cars by 2035. Washington and Massachusetts were the two states to jump on board with California. Now, the story says there may be a dozen more states that follow suit. Uh, what's going on here, David? Is this, is this just a, a blip, or is, is this the future? Well, I mean, this is uh, the future in certain states, right? And it's very simple to see the, the, the way the legislatures are made up or the governing bodies of these states. They're all blue states that are making these, uh, you know, inroads, if you will. Um, but it, it's a bit lunacy. Again, you're, you're in, in basically 12 years, you can't buy a gas-powered car. So, you know, is that reality, right? I, I don't think so. Uh, if, if electric vehicles are really ready for prime time, then why would we need to subsidize their purchase, Chip? Well, David, what kind of infrastructure would be required to provide the, the batteries and the electricity that such a system would demand if we really went electric? With well, and that's just think about it. So uh, California, obviously the lead state in, in here, has pretty good weather, right? So they, that, that's one of the things that California has going for it. It's an incredibly beautiful state from top to bottom. It's absolutely gorgeous from San Diego all the way up to the north uh, and Eureka, et cetera. However, in the northern part of the state, they have a little bit more severe weather. They get some pretty good snowstorms up there, et cetera. Um, and the climate with which you operate an electric vehicle is, is really important to understand. So I have several clients that own Teslas right here in town, you know, the, the, the pretty cars. They really are um, uh, unique vehicles, et cetera. But the battery life is very different depending on the temperature of the climate that you operate in. And what if you were stuck? What if you? What if a state like Minneapolis or Minnesota did this? And you're up in Minneapolis, and you got stuck in one of these crazy snowstorms. We've seen it just last year. There was people stuck for over 40 hours on an interstate blockage. How are you going to keep warm, <laughs> right? If your battery is dead, where if you had a gas-powered car, you could turn it on and off, run the heater, etc. I mean, uh, how are you going to, uh, you know? I mean, it's just crazy to think that these things, these things are just not ready for prime time. And of course, the whole push for this is, oh, it's the number one greenhouse gas, blah blah blah, right? That they talk about uh, that we're trying to save. If you want to talk about environmental friendly. Just go Google a picture of a lithium mine where we mine lithium, what that looks like and what we are doing to the earth and the environment to harvest the materials required to get these batteries. And by the way, these batteries have to be replaced every seven to ten years. There was actually on social media this week uh, from a Chevrolet dealership somewhere in the south, a Chevy Volt customer had the in took the invoice. It was twenty nine grand with labor to replace the battery on a seven year old car that cost forty five thousand when they bought it. Wow. I mean, now that, you know, and again, I don't know if that was real or not, I mean, you know, not yeah. certainly not valid, but mm -hmm. from all the research I've done, the, the lowest you can get a battery is about 7,500. And I've seen some cars where it's over 16,000 to, and then you have to pay for the labor to have it installed, et cetera. So I just don't believe these are ready for prime time. I'm certainly not going to be the guy to go out and buy there, but Hey, you know what? The law does says you can still buy gas powered used cars there. So I will tell you <laughs> it would be, might be a good business to be in. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, I'll yeah. be the guy here, you know, eight cylinders only. That might be my <laughs> motto, right? You know, well, well, a used car dealership with just eight cylinders. But again, this is this is legislators trying to mandate winners and losers. They're trying to force you into telling you how you can behave. That's that's totalism. That's that's wrong, right? Um, you know, if if EVs are really ready for prime time, you wouldn't need to legislate this, would you? Right? Because if they're more efficient and they're cleaner and they're affordable and they're competitive. The society the, would buy them anyway. The market would welcome it, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. again, the more the government legislates industries, the higher the prices go in those industries, and we have decades and decades of data to prove that. Anyway, I just think it's hogwash. <laughs> well, David, I almost, almost hesitate to even dip into this next story because uh, the IRS is not your favorite government institution. But uh, townhall.com headline reads, of course this is who Biden picked to lead centralized IRS for his massive expansion. So we're talking about the project to hire as many as 87,000 new IRS agents. And who's going to control them? Someone named Nicole Flax, who was a protege of Lois Lerner. 
Lois Lerner was the person who harassed conservative groups during the Obama presidency, slow walking applications for tax exempt status, targeting conservative groups for prosecution. And then when she was exposed, all of a sudden a bunch of her emails were lost. There was a lot of that going around in 2015 and 2016. Uh, high level people suddenly losing emails. But one of them that was captured quoted her. Th these are her words. One IRS prosecution would make an impact, and they wouldn't feel so comfortable doing stuff. Yeah, like exercising their First Amendment right to criticize the government. Um, David, I, I, this looks uh, very menacing to me. How does it look to you? Uh, it's really, really scary. Uh, Lois Lerner had, what, 35 visits to the White House, I think, confirmed on the sign-in yeah. log, et cetera, during this period. Where mm -hmm. So you know they were actively targeting, uh, you know, uh, they targeted Christian organizations. They targeted conservative organizations. There was a, that was kind of when the Tea Party was very uh, up, up running, you know, yeah. and they were mm -hmm. targeting all those organizations because there were many of those that were forming across the country. And, again, that's not what our country is based on. You should be able to protest left, right, whatever you think, right? You should be able to have a voice. We have, you know— and, and but we, we are getting to this where we're going to tell you what to think kind of mentality. I mean, and again, this younger generation, they need to go read some George Orwell. Right. Let's just go read, you know, 1984 and Animal Farm, uh, two quick, easy reads that really lay out. You, and, you, you know, back when I read these books and, and read those in high school. Right. You know, it's like, wow. Could you imagine if we get there? We're here. <laughs> it's a little scary for sure. But, yeah, the problem is that the IRS is absolutely going to target and, here, you know, they're going to target people, Chip, but it's not just conservative folks are going to target. They are going to target, as by what they've already said, mainly small business owners in America where jobs are created. Right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. if a small business owner, because they're targeting what's called pass through entities. Right. And these are typically businesses that are operating as S corporations, subchapter S's or LLC's, et cetera. And what it means when I say pass through, what we mean, Chip, is the income from the business then passes through to the tax return of the individual. And these are the folks they're going to target to audit, right? And, and even if you dot your I's, cross your T's, and you're perfect with all your receipts, to go through an audit, the average business owner will spend over $20,000 and about 90 hours of time to defend the audit to come out clean and easy. That means that resource, that time and energy is not going to be poured into their business to take care of their customers, their employees. It's going to hurt jobs. It's going to hurt economic growth. This is a disaster if it actually comes to fruition, um, you know, which, you know, why, you know, elections have consequences. Maybe this can get turned around before they get in, but it'll take them about two years to ramp up and hire these people. But again, it not, not looking good for small businesses in America. The IRS Commissioner Charles Reddick, this is how he described it, the creation of a new centralized office for implementation of all IRS related provisions. Well, you've seen the cartoons and memes out there, right, of IRS agents decked out like Rambo, you know, with, with uh, you know, AK-47s and bandoliers over their shoulders and stuff. Um, but uh, I, I tell you, d are you getting a sense now, friends, of why we at Retire Smart are so passionate about minimizing your tax exposure, your tax liability, uh, because th th they're coming for you, or at least they're going to try, thanks to that Inflation Reduction Act, well, David, listen, the some gift that yeah. keeps on giving. Yeah. Here's the reality. <laughs> uh, are taxes underpaid by a certain percentage of society? Absolutely. And and they do it through illegal or illicit activities, like, and that's tax evasion. What we are talking about is tax avoidance. By proactively planning your future decisions, you can lower your tax bill, right? We're not talking about cheating the IRS or hiding money under the rug or using offshore accounts. That, you know, we're not talking about people that money launder, you know, which is why, again, not for today's show, but a fair tax would simply bring a lot of that money back into the fold because then people that do illegal activities like, uh, you know, gambling or, or you know, and, and prostitution, all those things, if we just charged it in some kind of sales tax nationally, everybody would pay on consumption and you'd get revenue and you couldn't really cheat, right? So, Again, but that's not really what they're after. They're not after the revenue in, in general. They're after control, and that's what this will, will provide them. But again, they are coming for you as a retiree. The older you get, the less maneuverability you're going to have. And higher tax rates are the law, Chip. In three years and four months, your tax rates are going up. What most people don't know is that the brackets are shrinking as well. So you can have less income in each of those brackets. So not only will you pay a higher rate, but faster are you going to be pushed to the next bracket up. You can 
plan ahead and there are strategies you can implement like Roth conversions and QCDs and donor advised funds, all kinds of other things that can be implemented in particular for retirees to mitigate or reduce that tax bill greatly for the rest of your life, which can benefit you or it can benefit your kids or both depending on what the priority is. David, I'm only going to give you about 30 seconds for this, but I saw this at MarketWatch, and it worries me because some people get desperate, and they oh, I'm going to get the big score. I'm going to hit a home run. The headline is, the stock market typically bottoms before the end of a Fed rate hike cycle. Here's how to make that bet pay off. I, David, isn't it always dangerous to play time the market? And this seems especially risky catastrophically expensive if you get it wrong. Well, yeah. So if you're just purely out there trying to time the market, you, you, you don't have to be right once, Chip. You actually have to be right twice. So you have to pick when you're going to sell and get out of the market, and you have to pick when you're going to go back in the market. Now, we actually run some tactical models that do do a little bit of marketing time, but it's not the solo uh, portfolio would, would recommend for somebody. So it's going to be one of at least five for the typical client. We have, we're have we going to run multiple money management strategies. You always want to stay invested to some point. No one knows 100% what's going to happen. Uh, but there are indicators out there. And like I said, we thought the, the market was on a sugar high. It went right back up to its 200 day. That's a long-term moving average and turned away almost to the tick, right? And then it's come down six or 7% since then. But again, don't panic don't make irrational decisions and bet the farm because you think you know the bottom's in or the top vice versa etc have a plan be proactive in your planning take advantage of that complimentary report card 402-369-7777 no charge no obligation 402-369-7777 david bring us home hey have a blessed and prosperous week enjoy the weather here fall is coming soon Thank you for listening to Retire Smart with David Brooks. I'm Chip Maxwell. For David Brooks and the entire team at Retire Smart, have a great week.